It is determined to move forward. People have asked me, did you ever feel like giving up? There was never a time, even though we had a lot of problems, there was never a time when it was giving up time. It was always the time, what's the way around it? What's the answer? And those problems make you stronger. What did you actually go do? Like, did you go buy some leather and some rubber and start stitching it? Or like, what's the first move? I was 23, Jeff was 25. Mm -hmm. Like you, we were undestructible. Right. We do it. You know, so what? What's, yeah, so what's it about? Yeah, we'll do it. Right. We didn't think too much beyond that. You know, it's like, right. yeah, yeah, we're, we're not going to beat the world at this point. But we're going to have a try. We're just undestructible. Just get up there, do it. You know, if you don't give it that try, you don't ask all the questions about what's going to happen, what will this be, what will that be. You know, there's no such story. It is, this is, this is what we're going to do. And it's very focused. It's like, you know, don't ask too many questions. So we were young. It was just like, wow, this wasn't working. The, my father had said to me, look, when I'm gone and your uncle's gone, this business will be yours. And I, you know, I said to my father, look, dad, we don't want you to go. That's not the objective. But this company, J.W. Foster's will be dead long before you are. So what, what, what have we to inherit? Nothing. What we need to do is move on. So it was that challenge. We'd done two years. Jeff and I had done two years of national service. We'd been taken away from home, probably a bit like going to college now or university. We'd been taken away for two years. You know, mother wasn't making the bed. Mother wasn't making the breakfast or the dinner. You know, it was, you had to look after yourself. You had to learn how to do things, make you know, uh, make decisions, you know, be comfortable with your own life. And, and so that's what we did. That's how we managed to start off. Probably if we hadn't have done national service, we, we may well have just carried on because yeah. that was the status quo. But we didn't, we changed, we moved and, and we, we started the company. Um, purely and simply out of the fact that, look, we can't, this is, we can't stay here. Status quo is no good. We need, we need to try something. And like I say, we were young. Yeah, what can go wrong? Well, I, I actually, I'm glad you articulated that because I think there's a lot of people in the world right now who are going to hear this, this interview. And look, it's not 1958, but um, status quo, we're, we're in another period of time where for a lot more people than just a pair of brothers, status quo is not an acceptable um, state of affairs. I mean, there's a lot of, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in the world right now whose status quo has been completely upended in the last couple of years. And to your point about you were young, you didn't ask too many questions. You didn't allow yourself to get bogged down in, in the inconvenience of, of analysis, <laughs> what we call analysis paralysis. Mm. I, you know, I, 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 were, I come in contact with a lot of people through my organization, Entra, and I, I, I hear feedback from the advisors and we do surveys and, you know, I'm not the one on the phones, but I can tell you that there is a giant mass of people in the world right now who have a very untenable status quo, but they have not yet gotten out of that very adult habit of needing all the answers before they can take any action. And so I, I like that you said it the way you did, because I think people need to hear that when the status quo ain't cutting it, you got to move. Yeah. You don't have, you yeah. don't necessarily have time to gather all the, all the evidence because the evidence would all be based on the past anyways. Right. Um, so I, I appreciate that you shared that you came from a family of shoemakers, a, a shoe family. That's correct. Um, and in the late fifties, uh, for, for whatever reason, saw fit to venture out on your own with your brother and start what became Reebok. But why don't you fill in all those details for us, if you would? Why don't you do just that? Yes. Well, really, we've got a little good as a family business. And uh, we have to go back to 1895. That's a long time, isn't it? It really is long. I'm, yeah. <clears throat> I was born in uh, 1935, which is also a long time back. But 1895, my grandfather, he is a 15-year-old athlete not a good athlete but you know 
Mm. He was an athlete. And uh, his grandfather actually was a cobbler, repaired shoes. And my grandfather used to go visit his grandfather. And uh, he looked at what grandfather was doing. His grandfather was doing, and he was not only repairing street shoes, he was also repairing cricket boots. Mm. Now, okay, in the USA, we don't know cricket too well, but probably a little bit. But cricket, and cricket boots have spikes in the bottom. And my grandfather said to his grandfather, why have they got spikes in the bottom of this? Why, what's, what's this? And obviously grandfather said, it gives them grip. They're on grass, they're running. There's somebody batting, there's somebody bowling, or they're in the field. <clears throat> so it gives them grip. Obviously that was sort of, hmm, I'm, I'm a runner. We, we run on grass and we're running in boots and we're running in shoes, but we're slipping. Put some spikes in the bottom. So grandfather, he taken up the, the role as, as a cobbler, but he, he decided he could make his own shoes. And he did. He made a pair of shoes, very lightweight, spikes in the bottom. And from being sort of a midfield runner, he next uh, his next uh, race, he came second. Hmm. Well, uh, his teammates were obviously sort of uh, uh, a bit concerned here. You know, how have you done? Look at his shoes. You're cheating. Oh, oh, no, this is like, you know, just to give me a better grip. So that was the start of his business. Hmm. Everybody in his club wanted a pair of his shoes. <clears throat> then not only the club, but also the local clubs. They also saw what his team, Bolton Primrose Harriers, Bolton, north of England. This is the industrial revolution area. This is where people were working together. They were change life was changing. And as they we're all becoming teams, you know, soccer, you know, this is where this is the the home of soccer. This is where it started because all these people wanted to compete. They were challenging each other. So Joe had a business. My grandfather had a business. And by the year 1900, he'd started his business. Year 1904, he had supplied uh, a man called, um, what's his name now? Um, Alf Shrubs. Alf Shrubs broke three world records in one race. The race in Glasgow was a one hour race. And how far could you run in one hour? And he ran the farthest ever. And during that, he brought three world records. Brilliant. And during that first decade of the uh, 20th century, Joe also supplied Olympic athletes, got gold medals. Oh, there you go. But the second decade, World War I, that took them away from athletics. That took Joe's mind into, okay, what, what do we do? Well, we repaired army boots, boots mm. from Flanders, full of mud and blood and whatever. But then we come to the 1920s and, and we have a replica letterhead that, of the J.W. Foster and Sons business. And on that, it has, we supplied all the teams at the Antwerp Olympic Games with our shoes. And not only that, I think it's 96 teams in the United Kingdom, all you, if, if you know anything about soccer or football, Liverpool, Manchester United, Manchester City, all those teams he supplied. Fantastic. I mean, you know, he was, he was a, an entrepreneur in his day. Yeah. And, and he also knew how to influence people, supply the right people with his shoes, and the rest will buy. <clears throat> Today, the influence is street. In those days, it was just influencing other athletes. But that was good enough for Joe. So in the 1920s, that was grandfather's belly pock. That's when he supplied every Olympic team, wherever you want. And I, I don't know if you can remember um, Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire was a film. It was a film about three Olympic gold medal winners. And that was Eric Liddell, Harold Abrams, and Lord Burley. They all won gold medals in the 1920s. And grandfather, Joe Foster, supplied the shoes. Hmm. Fantastic. So he was obviously in his day, the top man. And unfortunately, he died in 1933. 1933, the age of 53. And I wasn't born until 1935. But you know, I had to be born, I think it's 15 months after my grandfather died on his birthday. So 
His birthday was the 18th of May. My birthday was 18th of May. And the significance is grandmother. My grandmother, was, she was a firebrand, Mariah. Mariah was a real firebrand. And so when I was born on her husband's birthday, I had to have his name. Mm. So grandfather was Joel Foster, I became Joel Foster. Four years after I'm born, we have World War II. And for six years of my, my life, we just have World War II. You're a kid, you grow up, and then, so what's different? This is what everybody experiences. Surely this is no different than everybody's childhood. Well, okay, end of the war, 1945, I'm 10 years old. Normal kid running around, doing the things you do, enjoying life. E education, college, and by the time I'm 17, okay, I leave college and I join the family business, the J.W. Foster business. Now who's running that business? Grandfather had died in 23. Grandmother had taken over as the, uh, the watchdog, but the sons, my father, and my uncle, James and Billy, or John, it was John actually called him Billy, they took over the business. And whilst grandmother was there, the business continued to be okay. But when grandmother died, and Jeff and myself, we didn't know that there was a feud between my father and uncle. They didn't speak. In fact, on more than one occasion, Jeff and myself had pulled them apart. But I'm 17. Well, you're young, you're enjoying life. It's fun, isn't it? But uh, 18, and both Jeff and I have to go to do national service. You know, it's not too long after World War II, national service is still there in the UK. So for two years, we both leave the business and we both do national service. Jeff, my older brother, he's older, by two years and, uh, than I was, and he went to Germany. What, what did he see in Germany? Adidas, Puma, what, what, what were they doing? They were moving the company on. They, they were, they, you know, the business was moving forward, wow. So we come back and in, uh, uh, we're talking 1955, we come back to join the business, the company. And what do we see? We see a failing company. Hmm. We see a company that's still making shoes they made in the 1930s and the 1940s. We try, we try our best to get them together, my uncle and father. We must have a plan. We must start marketing. I don't think marketing was the word in those days. We must start improving our business. We must start changing, get, getting some plans and didn't work. Jeff and I, we, we decided what we needed to do is to learn more about shoes. How, how about the business? So we did college. We did college at night for a couple of years. And even though we, we sort of said to our sort of father and uncle, come on, can we not move this business? No. So in 1958, decision made. We left the family business and we set up our own business six miles down the road and we called it Mercury Sports Footwear. I can go on from there to say, well, what happened after Mercury Sports Footwear? So, so Mercury Sports Footwear, that was 1958? That was 1958. So I just have to comment, and I'm not like a numerology guy, but it just seems worth pointing out that J.W. Foster was founded in 1895, and your company was founded in 1958. It's like you scrambled the numbers. Just seems like a... That's exactly right. You know, you're the first person to pick up on that. And I've done a, I've done a number of these interviews, <clears throat> but not, nobody else has picked up on the fact that this is just scrambling numbers, 1895, 1958. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it counts for something. But, um, and you got the same name as your grandfather. So, so you start as, what was it called? Mercury Sports Footwear? Mercury Sports Footwear, yes. Okay. Um, and that is the, the entity that later became known as Reebok, correct? Well, yeah. D have you read the book? I have not read the book, to be honest. Oh. I, I was, this, this interview was scheduled <laughs> close enough on my schedule. I didn't have time to read the book. Um, so, yeah, That's do you mind? Do you mind? And, and I know my audience like, may or may not have read the book. So um, can you bring us up to speed? How did, how did Mercury become Reebok? Of course. I can tell you the story. Well, Mercury became Reebok because 18 months... We're into uh, our new business. 
We're making cycle shoes. We're making running shoes. We're, we're a sports shoe business. Mm -hmm. And we're making a little bit of money. Things are happening. So our accountant, he, he said, Joe, he said, you, you better register that name. And I'm saying, why? Well, J.W. Foster's okay because Foster is your name. Nobody can just right. do it. You, you're setting up a name called Mercury. And if somebody else comes in and starts saying, oh, they're, they're doing pretty well. We'll make some Mercury shoes. You know, you, you've got somebody else making shoes under that name. Mm -hmm. But if it's registered, they can't do that. Okay, 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 register the name. So what do we do? Well, we go to the registrar. So we went to the registrar of business names and the registrar came back and said, mm-mm, you can't do that. It's already registered. Oh, right. Who am I? What, British Shoe Corporation, which is a big operation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, they, they've offered you the name. You can, you can, they're not using it. They've just got it registered. You can have it for a thousand pounds. Right. Well, you know, like let's, let's talk about a uh, hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is. It's, right. it's a, a number. You cannot, you know, we were small. We were just starting out. How do you expect us? No. So go see an agent, a patent agent, and a patent agent will help you get a name. So I go to see a patent agent. And it's, it's a nice warm day. And I'm sitting in his office. He has a window open. And he, and he points to a sign. And uh, it's Kodak. And I said, what's Kodak? Well, he said, exactly. That's it. It's nothing. It's a made up name. Right. Kodak belongs to them. It doesn't mean anything apart from them. Right. So he said, look, if you, if you can't buy the name, bring me 10 names because we've got to test these with the registrar. And if, if they're registered, we don't want to go one at a time. We want to test right. whatever. So I go back and we sit down around the table and look, we need 10 names. We can't have, uh, we can't have Mercury. So what do we get? We, we think of birds, we think of things like falcon, uh, hmm. or, or we're thinking of uh, animals like cheetah, or whatever. We come up with a, a lot of these names, but we go back to 19, 1940, I don't know, 1945, no, no, 1943. I'm eight years old. It's in the war. We, we have an athletics meeting. And I'm wearing Foster spikes, of course, so I have a big advantage. And I win a race. And my prize, what's my prize? It's a dictionary. Hmm. But it's an American dictionary. I didn't know at the time. This was a Webster's American dictionary, which, as you probably know, from the English spelling of some words, the American spelling, we just have a few differences, like color. Color. C-O-L-O-R in the USA, C-O-L-O-U-R in the UK. Anyway, I pick up the dictionary, you know, and I thought, ah, oh, I, I love the sound of R. We could, we, you know, R is a nice strong sort of beginning to it. So I'm looking through R in my dictionary, and it doesn't take long to get to E. R-E, R-E, B-O-K, what's that? It's a small South African gazelle. Gazelle, huh. oh, gazelle, isn't that what we are? Fast company, hmm. fantastic. Put this on top of the list, back to, the, back to our agent. And I say to him, look, here's 10 names plus, but we need that. We've found this name, Reebok, and we, we need to be in love with it. You know, we can't just run a company, we're not, it's gotta be our passion. So we want that one. And uh, so the agent said, okay, we'll test these with the registrar. As it happened, Reebok was the one that came out without any problems. Mm. With a couple of minor things, but he said, you can have Reebok. Fantastic. But the registrar said, okay, we can only put you in the B section of the register. What do you mean, B section? Well, the B section is that if anybody says we want to make shoes or we are making shoes out of Reebok skin, we can't stop them. Oh, right. 20 years later, the registrar came back to us and said, we moved you to the A section. Why? Well, everybody now knows that Reebok is a shoe. Hmm. It's no longer an animal. So that's how we became 
Reebok. Uh huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I, and I I will admit I didn't know that Reebok was actually uh, was actually a thing or a, a real word in outside of the shoe world. Um, there you so go. <laughs> it was a small South African gazelle, you said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. So so I mean let's let's walk, let's go back to 1958. So at that time, uh, and I did a little bit of research. Um, Nike was founded in 1964, so they didn't exist yet. And they were they were American. You were in Europe, right? Um, and from what I if I if I read the history right, I think you didn't actually come to America until 1979. I think there was a guy that bought the U.S. rights to bring it here. So, so was Adidas your primary competition, you know, when you started? Well, when we started, um, Reebok was a small company, but Adidas, Adidas had been going for 10, 20 years. They started off in the, in the 30s, I think, 1930s. Yeah, they Fosters were, have been going. Uh, credit years. Wikipedia for this, but they were actually founded in 1924. Well, there you go. That, but that could have been the father of the business or of whatever. Course, right. but they were, yeah, they were founded. And, uh, and, and, and I'm pretty sure that probably, uh, I mean, we, we all know that Addy and, or Adolf, he was Adolf and Rudolf, right. which became Addy and Rudy. They, they were a bit like my father and uncle. They, they just fought. And they divided because Addy, Addy started Adidasler, uh, Adidas and Rudy Dassler became Puma. Hmm. So they, they, had, they had sorted themselves out. But at that, when we actually left the Foster business in 1958, Adidas had really become a sizable business. And they had taken over what you know as soccer in the USA, and we know as football. They had taken that business. And, you know, even though we look back to that 1920 letterhead, when, you know, J.D. Foster was supplying all these teams with boots and uh, trainer shoes, you know, we wonder what happened. How did they lose that? There is a good story on, on, on why that, but when Reebok started, you know, we, they were too big for us. So we concentrated in athletics, track and field. Hmm. Track and field, we, um, we, became, uh, we became the experts. People recognized the company as a sports company. You know, a lot of people would make track shoes or boots or whatever, but they were usually uh, footwear people people engaged in making footwork rather than, than particular sports. And so we were recognized, very recognized in an athletics company. But we, we also recognized that track and field is not that big in the UK, but in the USA, every college, every university, they have coach and coach is God. Right. You know, and you can, you, 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 you can get a scholarship and you can go on an athletic scholarship to university college. That was the big market. So in 19, it was 1968, the British government decided that they wanted to see, they wanted to help the sports business to expand, to, ex, to do some exports. And um, I, I picked up this advert that said, look, if you, if, if you want, we will provide you with a stand uh, at the NSGA show. The NSGA show was the National Sporting Goods Association of America. Hmm. Uh, and that was in Chicago in February. <clears throat> we will provide you with a stand. We will also pay your return airfare. So you'll pay, and we'll pay 50% of your hotel. Didn't sound like a bad idea to me. So with a friend, off we went, 1968, uh, to the NSGA. And... Uh, I didn't sell any shoes. My friend actually sold some boots. He was, he was in the outdoor business. <clears throat> we were actually making the boots for him, so that, that was fine. We, it meant we did get some business. But the people came up and said, love you, love your product. Right. Um, where, where do we get it? And uh, I said, England. And they, they look at me and say, is that New England? I said, no, 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 it's not New England. It, it's across the water, it's England, you know, Europe. Oh. And so the resistance was trying to import. And they, they were, the statement was, look, if, if you've got somebody over here who can stop the shoes, we'd love to, we'd love to try it. Mm -hmm. Now we come back to the time that you were saying, 1979. It took me 11 years. Every year I was there hammering on the door. How do I get my product? I had six failed attempts, at least six failed attempts. 
different people. We tried, we tried to get in. But what was happening? What was happening in America was running. All of a sudden, running was becoming a big category. People were becoming involved in running. And Runner's World, which started off in the late 60s as just a single sheet of paper. By the mid 1970s, this was a glossy magazine. So big, everybody was reading this magazine and they felt so good. Bob Anderson, who was a publisher, felt so good that he could tell everybody which was the best shoe to buy. So he brought up his shoe edition and number one shoe, I, that great, however, you know, you've got a million people wanting that number one shoe. What, what he said was this was the best. And we're talking probably Nike, Nike, Vancouver, whatever. But he was buying his shoes. Phil Knight was buying the shoes from Japan. Right. Now, how do you turn up the volume? How do you get those, the demand? You don't. And it took six, eight months to get that volume to sort of meet the demand. Eight months after the, uh, the number one, within two, three months, you've got to get another number one. The retail trade, you know, they, they were absolutely, uh, well, they were out of their minds because they couldn't take this. By the time they got the shoes, everybody's saying, well, what's next? So it was causing uh, so much, so much problem. So, Bob Anderson changed the way that they were doing this and they turned to a, a star rating. So instead of being a one, two, three shoot, it was five stars, four stars, whatever. That, that was my, uh, that was my entree. I realized if we could get a five star shoe, we could, we could find that hook. You know, what, what, what do you get? We wanted a hook. We wanted something that, people wanted to buy our shoe instead of us trying to push our shoe. The hook would be a five-star shoe. 1978, we had the five-star shoe. Well, I thought it was a five-star shoe. <laughs> and it was called Aztec. We tested this out at the Commonwealth Games in, in Edmonton. Um, we had not only the Aztec, which was a trainer, we also had a racing shoe called Midas. And we had a, a spike track shoe called Inca. This was our gold range. We had the gold range. By 1979, February, I'm in Chicago again. And I have our gold range there. And I get Kmart. Kmart come along and say, we want 25,000 pairs. Right. That's about six months work for our factory in the UK. <laughs> but you know, we knew if we got a five star result, we knew that we would need help. So I had a good friend and got numerous friends in the business. And I had this good friend. He was just, he was uh, then the head of the, uh, a, a new section for Barter. Barter is probably the biggest shoe company in the world. If you take all, all the productions and uh, he was just doing a, a sports division for him and said, look, if you do get a five star, if you need production, we'll help you. You know, we'll make your shoes for you. They could do that at a better price than we could do. Back in, back in our own factory. But then came out wanted a better price. Ah, right. We also thought, yeah, <laughs> this is happening because now production is moving, uh, moving to the east, moving to far east. So I already had connections now with South Korea mm -hmm. and they were producing samples. So we were touching on if we got a five star shoe, we had the way to go. We're talking about February 79. The shoe edition comes out in August. We've got a few months there to wait. So I traveled backwards and forwards, meeting came out, meeting uh, Paul Fireman in Boston, who was running Boston Camping. He had come along in 1979 and said, look, Joe, I'd love to be your distributor, but we need a five-star shoe. You get a five-star shoe and that would be great. He'd come across to the UK and, he, and he'd seen that Reebok was top man. We were, we were winning events. We were, we were, oh, but then again, I took him to the right events. You know, we were, we were winning that. We, we, yeah. Our men were out in front. We're in Reebok. And now we're coming to, I, I think it was the last week in July of 1979. And uh, that's when the, you know, the, the edition always comes out the week before the month it's due. So I phoned Paul. I said, Paul, 
can you go down to the local kiosk? The, the runner's world will be there by now. Just go find how we did with Aztec. It was early in the morning, of course, but because midday when I fought him, about 7 a.m. in the morning mm -hmm. at Boston time, he came back an hour later and said, Joe, Aztec, fantastic, five stars, you've got it. Wow. That was it. You no, know, we, we had sort of hit, we hit pay dirt. We, this was it, this was gold. But he said, not only that, Midas has got five stars and Inca has got five stars. So we went into America with Paul Feynman with three five-star shoes. That was the hook that got us in. Hmm. So from 1958 to 1979, obviously that was the time you were trying to break into America. And I just want to make sure I'm getting the, the story right. You said you, you had six failed attempts to penetrate the U.S. market. Is that, did I catch that right? Uh -huh. um, so I guess I have a number of questions. I mean, I, I can tell you already, I wish we had like an eight-hour interview because I have so many <laughs> questions because it's like a long-form story and building an iconic brand and you know, it's just, it's, I, I can only imagine the amount of detail that I'm not going to get to cover, but you know, I'll just have to live with that. But, but let's start like in 1958. So you and your brother, Jeff, good name, by the way. Um, sure. Good, good name. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you guys decide, yeah, we're just going to go start our own shoe company and um, strategically we're going to focus on, on athletics as opposed to just being more of a general footwear company that happens to make some athletic shoes. Um, which is interesting because Phil Knight actually had the same observation with Nike that he actually started with track and field too. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. I think there's so many people that have a, an idea of starting a business, but you know, kind of like we're saying, they can't even picture the first few steps. So do you mind sharing what yours were? Well, you know, we were already somewhat in the business. The family, you know, we had a family recognition of what the business is, track and field. Um, but we'd also done, say, two years of uh, college. We, we met people within the footwear industry. Mm -hmm. We were able to learn. And not only were we to learn about it, we had a lot of friends then. So when we needed... Uh, we needed some machinery, we needed to do this, we needed somewhere to go. We asked people, we, and we got a lot of help. And, and I think that's so important. What is important is that don't be alone. Ask, ask questions, seek advice, seek help. Don't, you know, don't sort of sit there and listen to too much, but whatever you want, specifics you want, can you, can you get me this? Can you help? And we set up a factory, and we were able to start a business because you know, we could relate to people and, and we had our own business anyway. We, we knew the footwear business, but we knew we had to move on. You know, J.B. Frosters were at one level. Oh, brilliant. You know, they've been selling shoes to Yale University for five, 10 years. You know, 200 pairs a month to uh, Frank Ryan and, and uh, Bob G and Jack. Frank Ryan was the, the American uh, mile champion, I think, in his day. You know, and that's going back. But I mean, we, we needed to do something. You know, mm -hmm. We could see, we could see the world out there. How do you get there? And you've got to take it step at a time. You know, but it, it, it is determined to, to move forward. People have asked me, did you ever feel like giving up? And there was never a time, even though we had a lot of problems, there was never a time when it was giving up time. It was always the time. What's the way around it? What's the answer? You know, and those problems make you stronger. So, so you know, it's like, you just go for it. And my brother, he, you know, whether we learned knowingly from my father and uncle that they were at each other's throats, Jeff and myself were just good friends. We didn't live uh, each other's lives. We not, you know, we socialized differently, but Jeff just wanted to work in the factory. He loved the factory. He loved the idea of just making the shoes. And he was so happy that I, you know, it, you, know, you go do the selling, you, you go do the design and you, you do that. <laughs> and, and that worked for us. That's luck. You know, so many things depend upon that, that lucky 
uh, being, being in the right place at the right time with running, you know, having the right relationship. The only, the, the only, well, it's not the only bad thing that happened in life, but Jeff, unfortunately, he died uh, just as we got to America. Jeff was an athlete, but he pushed himself too far. He wasn't a good athlete. And unfortunately, he, he, he became ill with cancer and he died just as we got to America. But that probably even spurred me on more to say, Jeff would have loved us to make this. And so it's, it's, like, you know, it's what gives you the energy. And, and, and I think that energy is that pure determination that, no, we can do it. And we did. You just keep going. You just keep that energy. And, and I think you have to have that. You have to have that feel that, you know, we, we, we can make this. And uh, even though Jeff had died, it, it was a time to, at that point, we were nothing, but we were, we were on that cusp, that yeah. real cusp of really just making it. And so it, it had happened. So, you know, you, you alluded to luck, and I agree. There's, luck is a factor, but, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson said that uh, I find that the harder I work, the more luck I get. Um, so I don't, I don't want to discredit um, hard work. And that's certainly been my experience that, you know, the harder I work, certainly the luckier I get. But um, so yeah, let's, let's jump ahead again. I, 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 re I regret that I'm having to jump around the story because I, I, it's, it's so rich and I wish we had time for all of it. But uh, I mean, I think about my childhood, you know, I, I, one of the most iconic pieces of my childhood was the Reebok pump. In fact, there was the bullies uh, at school, at my school, they would, they would come up to any kids that had the pumps and they would go, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I want, a, I want a pair of pumps. Like, can you pump it up? I want to feel it, pump it up. And they'd, they'd reach down and they'd pump it up and they'd get, they'd get the kid really excited to pump it up to show it off. And then somebody would run out of nowhere and stomp on it to try to pop it. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's such a, it's such a memory. I mean, and I remember, um, I remember D Brown in the, the dunk competition. I'm sure you remember he did that no look dunk where he, you know, he, he dunked it, but he wasn't looking at the basket, but he, he bent over to pump up his shoes. Right. He did yes. that. And, and the very next day, everyone in my class had to have Reebok pumps. Had a pump. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, it was such a, so that was, I'm trying to do the, t the timeline. I was born in 1979. That's when Reebok really came to America. Right. And so then the 80s and, and it seems like early part of the 90s, Reebok really, really dominated. Um, and how long were you with the, you left, I think you said you left in 1989, you left Reebok? I left at the end of 1989. By that time, um, we were a $4 billion company. But how did we get there? You know, running was brilliant. And we got in with running with, with Paul Fireman. And this is fantastic. And we were doing nice business. There was a guy called Martinez, Arhil Martinez. I don't know if you if you heard of Arhil. Wait, Great. sorry, what, what was the name? Arhil Martinez. No, I don't. He, he was a tech rep for Reebok down in LA. And uh, that's a good, you know, he was a good athlete. Uh, but his wife, his wife, was going to these classes, aerobic classes. Mm. And she came home with her, with her friends and they were full of it. Ah, this is great. And Arnold is saying, well, what's going on here? What's going on? Oh, wow, these, this is fantastic. And they said, well, what's aerobics? And, um, and, and, and Frankie said, well, it's, it's exercise to music, but it really is good music. You know, it's really brilliant. And Arnold said, can I come down and have a look at this and see what's happening? Oh, why not? Next time he went down. And he went to these aerobic classes. And what did he see? He saw the instructor in running pumps. And he saw uh, half the class in, in running shoes. And the rest of the class, no shoes. So he thought, why don't we make a shoe just for these girls? Yeah, be great. This is Los Angeles, fantastic. Off he goes up to Boston because Paul is doing well with running. And he, he Paul, Paul, look, got this idea. These, uh, this, this is going on now down in LA, aerobics. And Paul is saying, what are you talking about, Arnold? He said, aerobics, it's, look, it's going to be big. But Paul's saying, look, we're doing fantastic. Our running market is really growing. You know, we're here with five-star shoes. We're doing fantastic. 
and we're growing nicely. We don't, we don't need to sort of have doing things down here for some girls just dancing. But Arnhill wasn't put off. He went round to the back door and had a word with the production people. And the production people said, okay, Arnold wanted 200 pairs. They gave him, they got him 200 pairs made with glove leather, nice cushioned, woman's fit. He gave them to instructors down in LA and, and a few of the girls as well. Um, yeah, that's the end of the story because that was it. All of a sudden it exploded. We were a $9 million company at that time. And a year later we were 30 million, then 90 million then 300 million, then 900 million in successive years. Hmm. And this was the aerobic explosion because you know, people like Jane Fonda started to wear the shoes in, in, her, uh, in her videos. Yeah. And all of a sudden it just exploded. The, you know, women, girls in America, people in America, just if, unless you were into running, you didn't know Reebok. You, you knew Nike, you knew Adidas, and what were they? Male, yeah. sweaty. This was nice, beautiful little company making shoes specifically for women. And, you know, and that just was something, that was magic. So all of a sudden this exploded. So by the end of 1989, we were nearly a $4 billion company. We were full of lawyers, we were full of accountants, we were full of people who knew how to sell boxes. And I'd, I, I'd taken on, I'd, I'd gone to developing the global distribution. So during that period, I, I'd put on at least 30 different countries, put people onto, I think we were, we were doing a billion then at international, a billion dollars. Hmm. So, and I got to the point where I'm just flying. I, I'm on an air, I'm at 35,000 feet every week and I'm visiting different, uh, different distributions, I, I'm arriving, I'm picked up by a limousine, I'm driven to the best hotels. And, you know, I meet with the top people and we're, we're having wonderful meals at the best restaurants. And I'm thinking, it's gone. This is no longer a challenge. This is just a big business now. Hmm. Time for me to step back. And, and for me, that, that, was, that was the, the feeling of, wow, you know, when, when you've been pushing hard for 20 years plus, and you've seen the, you've seen the growth, you've, you've enjoyed, you've felt this, uh, you know, you felt really that, uh, that feeling of it was achievement that, you know, and no longer then was it achievement. It was, well, it wasn't, it wasn't achieving anymore, but I thought it was time for me. I think I'd done my time, time for me to step back. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty profound. You know, so many people, I mean, that really speaks to the heart of the entrepreneur that, you know, I think what a lot of people would glamorize and what they would think would be the most fun would be what you describe the limousines and the, and the five-star dinners and the, the fancy hotels and, and just all the trappings of life. But for you, that wasn't really what got you up in the morning for you. It was the fight. Right. Yep. And that that's an entrepreneur for you. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, because, you know, my audience, obviously, I'm always trying to be cognizant of, of my audience. There's a lot of people in my audience that are, um, I think, kind of on the fence about this entrepreneurship thing. Uh, you know, my role in the market is I, I call myself an entrepreneurial evangelist. I'm out there saying, listen, I think the most stimulating, invigorating, and liberating life you can choose is that of the entrepreneur. You know, sink or swim, it's on you and it's great fun and it's a level of living that I think a lot of people never experience. And that attracts people that are like, huh, maybe I should consider this entrepreneurship thing. So I'm gonna put this out to the audience and say, if you completely understand what Joe just said about retiring once the challenge was, was won, then you're probably an entrepreneur at heart. But if you don't understand it because you're like, oh, well, man, I would have wanted to ride in the limos and I would have wanted to stay in the hotels. I would have wanted to have it easy. Then you're not an entrepreneur. No. The entrepreneur likes the struggle. You, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, 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 re I did retire and I did move back, but uh, it, it's a bit, 
with Reebok and me, it's, it's a bit like um, the Eagles and Hotel California. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, can check, you can check out, but you can never leave. You never leave, right? Oh, yeah. I say that to people about my company. You come work here anytime you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> So is that, does that mean that Reebok yeah, is cool. still kind of in your blood, no matter where you go, what you do? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. When it's doing good, when it's doing bad, of course, it's, it, it is that. You know, it's, it, it, you've got that feeling. Look, you know, you, you, you create something, so you suffer with it, or, or you actually enjoy whatever. And yes, you know, they keep asking me back. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because the... Um, you know, you, you look at Wikipedia, you look at some things on Google and you, you say, you know, how did Reebok start? And there are so many different uh, versions of this. People who think that they know how it started have made quotes have made. And, and so the book actually, it's there. Look, this is how it started. Yeah. A lot of people had asked me to write this, but it, it took a long time for me to, to get there. And uh, I think it took about seven years to write it. But, and it, you know, you start writing and... And you suddenly remember, oh, just a minute, this happened. Yeah, so I started going this way. But, you know, you've got to get a real focus. And, and I think that other people helping me, people who knew what writing was about, would help me say, no, keep focused. Yeah, don't go off on that, that. You've got to keep these things together. So putting the book together was quite, a, a, was quite a, an interesting experience. And so now it leaves me with that energy again. And the energy is to... Let's get this to a bestseller. Yeah. You know, let's get this to a bestseller. That's a challenge. And I'm enjoying that challenge. Yeah, so, so for me, I am now a new challenge. Well, we'll obviously, we'll make sure that we get a link to the book. And wherever this episode appears, we'll have a, a link in the description. Um, Excellent. Anybody that wants to, to grab the book. And personally, I'm excited to read it. I, I have to confess, I feel like I would not be in integrity if I didn't tell you, I have read Shoe Dog by Phil right. Knight. I've read Shoe Dog. Yes. And I have not read <laughs> Shoemaker by Joe Foster. Um, so after now meeting you, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I have to change that. And I'm excited to read it. Um, so, so let's talk about, uh, if we could, just a few more minutes. I know, um, are you good to stay for a few more minutes? I'm good. I'm good for as long as you want. Yes. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So, if we could, um, you left, officially left the organization in 1989. Like you say, it, you, you stayed in the Hotel California mm -hmm. forever. Um, but the 90s uh, saw was a change for Reebok. I mean, Reebok was ascending pretty much throughout your, what I guess that would be 31 year tenure. And, you know, from reading about it and even from personal remembering it, the 90s and the 2000s, it seemed like Reebok kind of dipped off. And I think it was 2005 that Adidas bought Reebok, right? Absolutely, yes. yes. Yeah, so, so what, how would you describe, let's say over that 20, 20 year period of the 90s and the 2000s, what do you think kind of happened with Reebok? And also for you, what was your personal experience of Reebok, you know, kind of falling back a bit? How hard was that for you? Well, it's fairly difficult, and, uh, and and I know the management, the management appeared to sort of try to move on, but you know during those uh, the uh, the eighties and the early nineties, the the biggest problem for the management was they didn't manage the company, the uh, the explosion, the, you know, the the fact that there was such a demand, the demand grew, you know, that, that that really grew the company and that controlled the company. Hmm. And so I think, I think the management had difficulty, difficulty in saying, well, you know, what, what happens when this slows down? I, I, I know before I left, uh, not too long before I left, I, I'm talking with Paul Fireman and Paul is saying, look, Joe, uh, I know how to stop this. But if I stop it, I don't know how to start it again. Hmm. And yeah, th this, I think, was the problem for the management at that point. It was so used to fighting the fires of how do we get production? Where can we get this from? How do we meet the demand? As against how do we create the demand? And so I think they got over the top of this hill and found themselves in no man's land, in, in a land of, we're not used to the idea of having to create business. 
So we went into American football, we went into basketball and did quite okay in basketball. But I, I think what they failed to do was focus. I think they failed to focus on what, what, what should we be. You know, we'd been in running, but we were, the big focus was aerobics. We were no aerobics, that was the big. And then trying to come into everywhere, they ended up probably nowhere and ended up in bits all over. Instead of probably focusing on either American football or basketball, basketball was doing quite nice for them. Maybe they should have focused enough on that to begin with to, to start to have ownership. Mm -hmm. right? And they were good with tennis, tennis. But if you try to do everything, you've got to be very careful because it is to do vis visibility. Yeah, If you're not visible in a particular sport, you know, you won't make it. It takes a lot of time to be that visible. You, know, you, you look at America and the, uh, the sports that are really part of the American uh, life, it, it's, it's either football, basketball, or baseball. It's not soccer. Yeah. It's not soccer. Soccer is something that is European. It's the rest of the globe. Mm -hmm. you know, here in the UK or, or wherever, every town had a soccer club. So your emotion is, is evolved in that. You, know, you support that. In America, it was basketball, you know, baseball, or American football. So you've got to decide if you're going for the emotion, you've got to focus and you've got to get not only the players, not only the teams, you've, you've got to get the supporters. You have to win, win them. Because right now, uh, sport, Sport controls fashion. Street fashion now is all to do with sport, whatever runs over. And we have people now who, you know, it's changing, changing so much. Influencers can be anywhere, mm -hmm. but you have to be careful that you're not all over with influencers. Get the influencers focused. That way you'll have an audience. If you're all over, and I think this is what happened with Reba and Tully. Adidas bought it. Why did Adidas buy Reebok? They bought it because Adidas wanted more influence in America. And, and Reebok had picked up a lot of uh, agreements with the NFL and uh, the basketball. And what, you, know, you buy a company, what do you do? You take the pitch you want and you put it into, your, in, into Adidas. You can't blame them for that. That's, that's what they paid the money for. Right, and, right. Yeah, and that's what they did. But Reebok then, just sort of settled down to become really and Adidas just tried to put Reebok into fitness but you know fitness is okay but you need to be very very focused because there's no visibility right yeah you know, you know, the visibility is with with say uh, team sport team sport where you've got spectators you know this is where the visibility comes television cameras are on there you see you see Nike you see Adidas you see those names and this is it the times that you see it puts it in your mind right. it seems yeah. like crossfit is kind of the closest you get to exposure with fitness it is it is yes it is but but i don't think uh i don't think again that they they focus reebok enough. plus the fact that adidas changed the letter styling of reebok they also changed from the vector to the delta so you confuse people's images hmm. you know when when you think of ford you just see Ford, you just see the lettering. Yeah, you see the, the curly font with those circle right. circle around, or the oval around it, yeah. That's right, you just see that. Now, if you confuse that and to put a different typeface on, put different, you know, people say, what's that? You yeah. know, it's, it's, and however, over the last, I think it's about two and a half, three years, I think Adidas got themselves a, a new marketing person looking after Reebok, and they, they brought back the vector, they removed the delta, and they brought back the Mototectura lettering, which is the same that Apple used to use way, 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 way back. Huh. And the drop, the drop R. And, and I think now people are beginning to see again the same, the same message. And so if you want to get anywhere, continue with the message. Because you might get tired of it. You might have seen it a million times. But the guy down the road has probably only seen it once. It, you know, that's, yeah, you've got to keep pushing that same message. And that same message will get you that recognition. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of value in it, I think, in, in everything you just shared. First of all, um, this idea of, of focus. 
Um, and, and especially, I love when you said, we were so obsessed with meeting demand, we didn't focus on generating demand or creating demand. You know, I remember reading um, a book about Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Uh, I actually in, in, interviewed the author, Stephen Karen Anderson. They wrote a book called The Bezos Letters. And one of the things they talked about in that book um, was, you know, Jeff Bezos says, he says, whatever you're seeing in the market that Amazon's doing, that's the result of work that we did two to five years ago. Right. Which means everything that the, pu that the public is talking about that we're doing, that's actually work that's already done. We need to be obsessed with what's going to keep the conversation going two to five years from now. Yes. And, and that hit me hard because my company has exploded in the last 12, really 12 to 18 months. I mean, we've grown four by 18 months. We've probably grown almost 5,000%. And a lot of that has been the, the intensification around the conversation of, working online, working from home, generating additional income. You know, I teach entrepreneurs on the internet. So, but, but you're, this is a timely caution to say, Jeff, you can't rely on COVID to keep you relevant for the next five years. You have to be figure, thinking how to keep that conversation going five years from now and generating the demand. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, I also, I, and then I love what you said about just, just being focused I'm curious, actually, I actually have two questions that came to mind um, as you were talking. One, the, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but Reebok very often exists in proximity to the British flag. Isn't that part of the iconography? Well, that has to go way, 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 way back when we, uh, when we first got the running shoes into, uh, into the USA. We had the Starcrest, which is a very nice thing. And in fact, the Starcrest is on really the uh, Reebok classics even today. But Paul said, look, Joel, this is great. He said, but to get the uh, USA public to, to recognize the star crash, it's going to take, it's going to cost us millions. Right, right. <laughs> Long time. He said, but everybody knows the Union Jack. Yeah. Everybody knows it. And I, I'm from the UK and I think, well, yeah, okay. I didn't know that everybody in the US knew the Union Jack. Everybody knew the Union Jack. So we put the Union Jack on. And this was one of the things that really gave that visibility because we didn't have much point of sale. You know, we didn't have many things that we could put into shop windows and things, but what we did have was a box and the box had a union Jack. Yeah, on the lid. That's right. And uh, each of the shoes had a little union Jack on it, but the retailers, the stores with the window, they used to put the boxes in a pyramid, mm -hmm. stack all union Jacks. And then they'd put a shoe on each of the box on the pyramid. And it was fantastic. Yeah. And, it, it, and, and so the Union Jack did, because I think Paul was absolutely right. People in the USA recognized the Union Jack. And so it was contributory. It helped to sort of get that recognition. Union Jack, Reebok. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, because they're so, they're so conjoined in my mind. Um, right. and, and I also want to just, you know, emphasize what you said about the frequency of of reinforcing your brand, you know, like you said, I mean, as, as a business owner, I, I'm, I'm practically sick of hearing about it. I'm sick of seeing it. It's like all day, every day, I'm saturated with my business, but to the, to the yes. world at large, you know, it's somebody made a comment to me once, uh, or I know it was in a book, actually a really good book actually called less is more as, and this was when I was the CEO of my company. I'm, I'm not actually the CEO anymore, but the book said, as the CEO, you're, until your employees are rolling their eyes and mocking you for how much you talk about the values of the company, you haven't actually talked about the values enough. And I think there's a similar principle in branding that until people are like rolling their eyes and just nause nauseously sick of seeing your brand, you haven't actually gotten your brand out there enough. I don't think a lot of people, I think a lot of people sometimes take their own feeling about their business and apply it to the public. And I think it's a huge mistake because the public, whatever you're doing, the public needs to see and hear about it more, period. Absolutely. Yes, you really do. Um, 
so I'm curious, a final question, and then uh, I, I, have, I literally have to be on an interview in four minutes. And for, I should have wrapped this 10 minutes ago, but I'm enjoying it so much, I like can't tear myself away. Um, so I just, I have to ask you, you know, in hindsight, it seems like, you know, the relationship between Nike and Michael Jordan, I mean, that, yeah. that did, that, that was an era defining relationship in, in retail fashion, right? Yes. Do you think that there's anything you could have done in, in, in the big scheme to, to, to win that fight. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't have been second place, but do you think that the Nike Jordan pairing in American culture was something that you or Adidas or, or anyone could have actually overcome? Or was it just a competition for second place at that point? Well, I, I would never take on a view that you're in second place. Okay. I always take on a view that the place is number one. And okay, so somebody's got a real winner. But you know, Reebok has Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and also Alan Iverson. Yeah. Who crossed and, over Jordan. That was yeah. such a good game. Yeah. So, you know, the leverage wasn't right. They, they didn't leverage that. There they should have been more leverage. Now, yeah, this is, you know, you've got to look at the competition and say, how do we compete? You know, not saying, oh, yeah, okay, they're okay, they're doing whatever. We'll do a bit over here. No, that's competition. You know, it's like, how do, how do we compete? And I think Shaquille O'Neal and Alan Iverson, they, they, they could have done the same. They could have been a joy. Yeah. It's, it's just creating it. And, but again, it's like we were saying, you've got to be there again. Again, 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 again. Get tired of me. You know, <laughs> until everybody you're, you're saying you don't think they did that. Because you're right. I, I mean, Shaquille O'Neal, he he was the heir apparent to the to the iconic Jordan torch yes. for basketball and sports in America. And you're saying you don't feel like the guys went far enough and hard enough with that relationship. Yeah. Shaquille O'Neal. And Pump, you know, what? You've, you've got so many winners. You know, you've got to play a winning hand. And somewhere around here, it, they didn't. Hmm. And, and that winning hand is continuing, continuing. Even today, you know, we've got Air Jordan. Even today, Jordan means an awful lot with that Nike connection. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's there. It's, uh, but not so much Shaquille O'Neal and Reebok and Iverson. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Cause you can, you, you almost can't think Jordan without thinking Nike, but right. you can think Shaquille without thinking Reebok. Right. Yeah. That makes perfect sense, man. What a great lesson on doubling down on your winners. And if you love entrepreneurship, then you'll want to keep watching. So click the next interview right here for some more millionaire secrets gold. Thanks for watching. Your most cherished asset in any brand would be trust. People are buying trust. They're buying credibility. And it's probably the, the hardest to build and easiest to lose.